Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever you are at the moment, um, welcome everybody, and then thank you to those joining us live and to those listening in afterwards. I also like to warmly welcome our speakers and the moderator today, whom I'm shortly introduced in the webinar. This webinar is entitled as Healing from Our Heroes, and the Students and the Young Pharmacists on the Front Line, Part 2. This is organized by the FIP Young Pharmacist Group and the Academic Pharmacy Section. This is the second session after a successful panel discussion about the experiences of our young heroes in the COVID pandemic broadcasted in June last year. And we are very happy to bring this session again with new panelists to you today. I'm Dr. Naoko Arakawa, Assistant Professor at the School of Pharmacy, University of Nottingham, UK. I am also an Executive Committee member of the FIP Academic Pharmacy Section and the Global Leader of Competency Development for the FIP Workforce Development Hub. I'm honored to welcome all of you to this webinar and moderate the session together with my wonderful co-moderator and the panelists today. First of all, I need to um, inform you all about the house rules. This webinar is recorded and live streamed on FIP Facebook and also will be available at the FIP website in the afterward. Please also ask your questions via Q&A box which will be answered by speakers at the end of the session or in a written form at the uh, format during the webinar. Please also provide your feedback uh, by emailing to webinars at FIP.org as your feedback will help improving our webinars. Finally, if you find these FIP webinars helpful, please consider becoming a member of the FIP at the FIP website if you haven't been a member yet. Now, let me introduce the FIP for those who are not familiar with the organization yet. The International Pharmaceutical Federation the FIP was founded in 1912 and being the global federation of national associations and the individual members representing 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists around the world. FIP's vision is a world where everybody benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines in the pharmaceutical care. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences, and education. FIP Academic Pharmacy Section as a supporter of this webinar was founded in 1972, placed in the Board of Pharmaceutical Practice and FIP Education. Our mission is to serve as an international source for networking, collaboration and inspiration for educators to transform pharmacy education for the purpose of advancing practice and science to meet the present and the future health needs in communities around the world. I'm now pleased to be introducing our co-moderator, Mr. Dimitrios Elias Nabaradas. Dimitrios is a PhD candidate at the uh, Gate University Frankfurt, a structural genomic consortium in Germany. He is also a young pharmacist group while he's the academic pharmacy section liaison. Over to you, Dimitrios. Hi, Naoko. Thanks for, for the really kind introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm part of the, as Naoko said, part of the Young Pharmacist Group, and I will introduce it to you. Uh, the YPG is a network of uh, motivated young pharmacists and young uh, pharmaceutical scientists within FIP, uh, which was officially established in 2001. Our objectives are to facilitate connections and networking so that uh, new ideas can be shared and to open doors to information and new possibilities. Uh, the mission of YPG is to promote the goals of FIP by encouraging the young members of the Federation to participate in FIP projects and activities. And let's move over. Uh, today, uh, we will hear pharmacists and students from different regions. 
uh, we will learn about their experiences working in different countries uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and share their stories. Uh, we will also discuss some of the challenges and possible solutions uh, faced by them uh, during uh, working uh, in the COVID-19 uh, period. So I will now, um, I'm now pleased to introduce uh, all of our panelists, starting with Sarah. Uh, Sarah started her career as a community pharmacist in the UK in 2012 and was a community pharmacist manager for six years. She moved to New Zealand and joined the Ministry of Health in 2018 and has been in the immunization team since May 2019, leading on a variety of programs and projects, including the influenza immunization program, a cold chain policy, and the, uh, re the response of the um, 2019 measles outbreak. Uh, Sarah is also a registered pharmacist, a registered vaccinator, and has a Master of Development Management. Her focus is on promoting equitable health, health outcomes through the decolonization of the health system. Uh, moving over to, the, to our next guest, uh, Chantal is a graduate pharmacist in the Netherlands since 2019. Uh, currently, she is in the second year of her training to become a hospital pharmacist which is a four-year nationally organized specialization, and it's similar to medical specialization. Uh, she has special interests uh, in contributing to get medicine more, more personalized uh, by further exploring the role of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, moving over, uh, Gelan is 24 years old, uh, born in Asyut, Egypt, and graduated in 2020 from the Faculty of Pharmacy Clinical Pharmacy Department in the Ashkid University, Egypt. Uh, since 2015, she has been an active member in the Egyptian Pharmaceutical Students Federation and served as a local exchange officer in the EPSF Ashkid Local Association in 2017 to 18. She served in EPSF uh, in Egypt Student Exchange Officer uh, in 2018 and 19 and was awarded Best Student Exchange Officer in Eastern Mediterranean Region and was also part of Student Exchange Committee in 2019 and 20. Uh, currently, she's serving as IPSF Chairperson of uh, Student Exchange 2020-2021. And also, she works uh, as a hospital pharmacist in a private hospital and she's achieving a professional dip diploma in IPC. Uh, finally, our uh, last speaker, Tanaka, is an exceptional public health pharmacist and currently the Secretary General for the GOPWI um, uh, South District COVID-19 Interministerial Task Force. Uh, he is currently uh, the FIP YPG Public Health Officer for Zimbabwe and has been the IPSF Projects Director for the Afro Region, the ZPSA President and the University of Zimbabwe Vice Chancellor's Brand Ambassador. Tanaka has won several awards, including Outstanding Leadership and Business Networking Awards. Currently, he's uh, spearheading the establishment of uh, district drug information centers in Zimbabwe. Uh, moving over to the next slide. Uh, so the main topic, uh, the main topics of our panelists are going to that our panelists panelists are going to cover today with their talks include uh, sharing uh, their working experience through COVID nineteen, uh, listing a few challenges that they faced at the front line, and potential solutions to those barriers, and finally by sharing um, any lessons learned during their experience. So we can um, move over to our uh, first guest. So Shara is not here at the moment. Um, she's currently in the Cook Islands supporting uh, their COVID-19 vaccine roll, uh, rollout. So we, we will broadcast, broadcast her video. Kia ora. hello and thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging Te Tangata Whenua or Aotearoa, the indigenous peoples of this land, New Zealand, where I'm lucky enough currently to live and work. 
Um, and secondly, I'd like to thank FIP for inviting me to talk about my role this evening and, and the impact of COVID. And I apologise for not being able to attend live and in person. Uh, Immunisation is widely regarded as the second most effective public health measure in terms of disease prevention um, after clean water. And my role as the principal advisor in the immunisation team here at the Ministry of Health in New Zealand is to design and implement health operational health policy um, to deliver equitable immunisation coverage for all of our populations here in New Zealand. Um, this includes on a day to day basis looking at our service delivery models, but also the system structures um, that are in place that enable or in some cases disable us to achieve that goal of an equitable and successful national immunisation programme. Um, New Zealand, I'm sure you all know, has delivered a world renowned response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have not been unaffected. Um, in my area of work, immunisation coverage for our children, our tamariki, has decreased in the last year, particularly um, for our tamariki Māori, um, and it's decreased across all of our immunisation programmes, right, from prenatal um, vaccination in pregnancy through to our adolescent and adult immunisation programmes, apart from influenza, which um, I'll come back to in a while. But it's disproportionately affected our tamariki Māori, our indigenous children, um, as is so often the case for populations that are already dealing with the effects, the after effects, the ongoing effects of colonisation. So some of the decline in our childhood immunisation rates can be attributed directly to COVID-19 through the lockdowns and the impact that they've had on access to health services. Um, meaning that some people were unable or less willing due to um, a perceived risk to access those services. And um, for others, the volume and noise um, of misinformation around not only COVID-19, but also immunisation in general has meant that they've thought twice around getting their routine immunisations or have delayed it until they're able to access more information. Conversely, in our influenza programme, we've seen um, a huge increase in engagement, particularly last year during 2020. So our influenza immunisation programme in New Zealand starts on the 1st of April each year. And on the 1st of April, 2020, we were really still figuring out what the scale and the impact of this global emerging global pandemic was going to be. Um, this year so far 2021 looks like another huge year for influenza immunization in New Zealand. Um, last year COVID-19 not only increased demand for influenza vaccination but it also impacted our ability to be able to supply that vaccine. Our manufacturer is not located in New Zealand and as borders were closing and air freight was becoming less and less available um, we had issues with both the supply of the vaccine to New Zealand and also the distribution within New Zealand itself through lockdowns and, and the impact that that had on our supply chain. The COVID-19 vaccination programme has created its own impact on my role. Um, so it sits outside of my team in the ministry with another, another group, but it from a from a public and a health sector perspective, of course, the resources that are available to deliver this huge, the biggest immunisation programme the world has ever seen um, against our, our normal, our routine immunisation programme, um, both in terms of logistics and health sector capacity to deliver both programmes has obviously been hugely impacted and we, and we continue to, to mitigate the risks around that as we progress with our COVID vaccination programme. Um, our team's work in that has included providing advice on both the logistics and operational elements of developing that COVID-19 vaccination programme. Um, and also we've supported working with our contracted partners to uh, deliver a new and increased training programme for um, our vaccinators to enable us to quickly build and develop um, a much more depth within our vaccinator workforce. So COVID-19 has provided many challenges for my role in the past 18 months, 
um, and promises to continue to provide more moving forward. Um, but it's also provided some opportunities. So it's brought immunisation really to the forefront of people's minds across the globe. Um, for people, many people, particularly in the global north, that might have forgotten what it's like to live with vaccine preventable diseases, thanks to um, years of successful immunisation programmes. It's really reminded us of what it can be like when vaccines aren't available for diseases. Um, on a personal note, I've been able, as a pharmacist vaccinator, I've been able to train to deliver the COVID vaccine and then partake in um, working with us, a local provider within my community to deliver those vaccines. Um, and I'm lucky enough, the reason I can't attend this evening, to be deployed with the New Zealand Medical Assistance Team in supporting the Cook Islands to be able to deliver their COVID-19 vaccination programme, which is vitally important to a country that uh, is uh, tourism is of huge importance to them as a country. So the, the quicker we can vaccinate their population, they can vaccinate their population, um, the quicker hopefully they'll be able to open their borders and get back to some semblance of economic normality for them. Most importantly, though, for my role, COVID-19 has provided an opportunity to examine and review um, the current state of our immunisation services. Um, and, and an opportunity to look at innovative solutions to immunisation services through the COVID-19 immunisation programme. Um, and that's provided an opportunity in particular for us to look at access to services for our Indigenous Māori population and other underserved populations in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So a huge opportunity for us to do better by those populations moving forward. Thank you for your time this evening. I hope the rest of the evening goes well. Kia ora. So would like to thank very much Sarah for sharing the, her really powerful message. So even though she's not here, um, we think that it's quite amazing that she even that find a way to to broadcast and showcase her experiences and her challenge that she faced so far. Uh, now let's move over to our next speaker, Chantal. Yes, thank you, Dimitris, for introducing me. Hi, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I would first like to follow up on something Ramon Contrici told you guys in the previous FIP session. Um, he told us that distributing COVID patients over uh, the Netherlands is quite a difficulty. And last April, we encountered the third wave of COVID. And um, at some point, hospitals, some hospitals in the Netherlands um, had close to zero IC beds left, intensive care beds, uh, for either COVID or non-COVID patients. And well, of course, I know it's a really privileged position to be in that most of the time we do have all the IC beds we need in the in the Netherlands, but um, for us it's almost unthinkable to have no intensive care beds left uh, for the patients we have in the Netherlands. And uh, I would like would like to share that with you today. And uh, luckily we've passed the peak of the third wave and uh, the vaccination strategy is showing its effect. And that brings me to uh, my COVID working experience that I would like to talk a bit about. Uh, Sarah also just um, shared with us the vaccination strategy in New Zealand. And uh, I would like to also share something about our uh, experience in the Netherlands. We started uh, vaccinating in January last year or this year. And um, hospital pharmacies play a big role in the vaccination strategies. Um, and of course, we started also with uh, vaccinating employees that were vaccinated in the hospital, uh, but also um, um, patients that were, that were at risk of having a problematic a COVID infection, such as cancer patients. So um, we started with uh, nurses and doctors on the uh, COVID wards and the intensive care wards. 
and um, also ambulance workers. And for these patients that were vaccinated in the hospitals, the uh, pharmac pharmacist assistants, they uh, drew up the vaccines uh, in ready to administer syringes. And the pharmacist, they uh, did the double check and then also released the batches for the use in patients. So it was logistically, but also, um, you know, to do all of those things uh, next to the regular um, healthcare we provide, it was quite a challenge uh, to provide those, all, all those vaccinations to the patients and the employees. And um, we may thought that that was that, but uh, the government hoped that the 60 hospitals in the Netherlands uh, are able to provide uh, 1 million vaccines uh, per week. Uh, in a couple of weeks, because we are planning to uh, um, roll out the vaccination uh, to the, um, uh, the, the other part of the population that has, well, currently not the biggest risk of having a COVID infection. So that will be a really big challenge for us uh, in the Netherlands. And I think 1 million is, well, maybe too much. I hope that we are able to pull off uh, half a million. Uh, I would be also proud of us then, uh, but we'll see. Maybe we will be able to pull it off and um, uh, that would be great for the immunization of uh, our, our people in the Netherlands. Um, I was also asked to list uh, challenges that I faced as a young pharmacist. And well, for me personally, the biggest challenge was being quite inexperienced because I graduated in 2019. Um, in the summer of it, and uh, I started working at uh, The Hague and Leiden um, six weeks prior to the pandemic uh, reached the southern parts of the Netherlands. And at that point, you were still really to get to know your colleagues and your new working space. But uh, it was well quite difficult to find my place in um, well during a crisis, really, because how was I supposed to know? What to do during a crisis when I was still learning to be just a regular hospital pharmacist in training. So for me that was my biggest challenge and uh, a barrier, um, uh, a solution to that barrier for me personally was to be able to realize that all we had to do, you know, just young pharmacists but also the more experienced pharmacist uh, is to be just doing what we're great at, doing what we excel in and I think that we excel in um, uh, providing safe medicine. And I think that, you know, also during the vaccination strategy, but also during the COVID, uh, COVID care that was new to us, um, you know, how, how do COVID patients react to normal treatments that we would give people with uh, virus infections? Um, I, I think that if we as pharmacists just do what we're great at, we will, uh, be able to to pull it off and also as young pharmacists I think it's a great time to learn because um, actually only the the how do you say the core of the care of hospital pharmacists that we deliver um, the core remains and the core is most important at this part um, also I was asked to share a final lesson that I was learned during the COVID-19 crisis and well the biggest lesson for me was that everything turns into fluid under pressure. Sounds uh, uh, cheesy maybe, but you know, some decisions in a hospital would normally take up to months or years. And uh, some of those decisions are made in hours or maybe days in a crisis. And uh, for example, I was uh, asked to make a uh, set of intubation medicines. So whenever a COVID patient came in and they had to rush to intubate the patient, they would have a nice package of all the drugs they use uh, during the intubation. And well, I reckon that, you know, making such a set in normal situations would maybe take months or maybe even a year to get all the, the people that are involved in that process to have the same opinion. And uh, well, I, I had to look it up because it's, you know, more than a year ago, but I, I saw that at the moment we, uh, we decided to make those sets. Uh, 48 hours later, I had a set. I had all the sets. I made all the sets and they were ready for use. And I think that's, you know, just the right example of that everything turns into fluid under pressure. And uh, that is what I would like to uh, 
end my part today and I would like to thank you for your um, your listening and I'm looking forward to the rest of the FIP webinar. Chantal, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, it's your your message message is really impactful. Uh, so as pharmacists, of course, we have the education, and we we want and we will we are we are able to to excel in uh, situations like this. And obviously, this COVID nineteen uh, pandemic is new to all of us. But I think if we collaborate together if you collaborate with the doctors and if we listen to the patients needs also we will be able to succeed and overcome as we do already um, let's move over to our next speaker now uh, Gelan. Uh, thank you, Demetrius, for handing over the floor to me. Well, my name is Jilan uh, Mahmoud, and I'm from Egypt, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, as Chantal has said, uh, it's been quite challenging for young pharmacists to work in during the pandemic. Uh, and as she shared, like some insights about the vaccination that happened like in Netherlands, I would like to share uh, some insights of how the vaccination and COVID-19 situation is also in Egypt. Well, Egypt like has started uh, COVID-19 a bit, uh, like the wave for COVID-19, like a bit later than the rest of the world. So we're experiencing waves a little bit different than the world like when the world was in the first wave we weren't very affected and when the world was in the second wave we were in our like uh, hardest times so we have started the vaccinations and it's optional vaccination uh, for um, everyone it's open for everyone but the priorities are for medical personnel and for people with chronic diseases and elderly um, one of the challenges like regarding vaccination is that people are sometimes hesitant and they are quite afraid. So whenever you encounter like a person and they know that you're a pharmacist, they are like, is the vaccine safe? Like, do you recommend taking the vaccine? And this is where your part uh, starts to educate people and make them more aware. So this is also my first challenge is uh, that sometimes the concept of taking care of ourselves during COVID, like people are treating it as like normal flu. So you as a medical um, personnel or medical professional, you try to make people more aware to take care of themselves more and more during COVID-19. So um, I have just graduated uh, in COVID-19 itself, like my exams, I experienced it uh, taking my exams virtually and uh, taking my lectures virtually and so on. So it was quite a bit rushed, uh, my graduation. Um, and you put uh, to the field of work very fast. Like you're, you're now a graduate, you're now a pharmacist, a registered pharmacist, and you have to learn how to accommodate to the situation that we're in. And I think that we're a bit lucky as like young pharmacists graduating at that time, because we get to see something that maybe our, uh, like um, like the older pharmacists haven't got to, to experience, which is the adrenaline rush of uh, that I have to learn. I have to um, make myself more educated regarding COVID and how to work safely also in my environment. Uh, I work in a community pharmacy and it was quite a bit challenging because um, not all community pharmacists, uh, not all community pharmacies have the, um, you know, that safest environment, like we don't have like shields, not all people wear masks and so on. So it was quite challenging also to educate other pharmacists that we need to take care of ourselves in order to be able to take care of people and in order to provide service. Um, and when I moved to hospital pharmacies, I know uh, hospital pharmacy, I know that this was my place. So it was also another challenge that I have to discover myself. I have to discover where I would like to work as a pharmacist. As a pharmacist, um, I graduated from clinical pharmacy department, but since COVID and its challenging times, I haven't been able to participate in uh, clinical rotations and so on because it's quite unsafe for us as students. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, like take the next step and like work as a cl clinical pharmacist during COVID-19. Uh, but as a hospital pharmacist uh, in my in my hospital, I work usually towards outpatient and and like um, giving the prescriptions. Um, and uh, the challenging part also I found is uh, people tend to ask like they don't trust everything like they don't trust the the, the medications that were prescribed to them uh they they're quite afraid so there also comes your role to make them believe in what has been prescribed to them and what the doctor said and try to calm them down because whenever someone like discovers that they are covid they panic um another uh, challenge that i have faced is that I'm not really experienced and educated enough to help people. So there comes the time where you have to learn, where you have to educate yourself, where you have to search for solutions for like their problems, that you have to learn how to communicate with them, like people who are afraid and uh, they're like, like having COVID and so on. And also the unsafe environment as well, like you, you, like you are quite scared on like for your family that you uh, contract the disease and uh, you might like go back home and um, your family could contract the disease as well. So you are as a young promise feel so much responsibility uh, towards everyone, um, especially like this is like my first year of uh, working like in real uh, field. Um, but I would I would say that it's quite uh, nice. I, I'm not uh, like uh, what what's the word? Yeah, uh, I'm not scared. I'm I'm enjoying the process. I'm enjoying the experience. I'm enjoying the journey itself, and I'm happy that I was put in such a situation because it teaches us as pharmacists as. Uh, Chantal has said, like we, uh, like our core, like what we have learned, we we uh, bring out the best of us. We bring out the best of what we have been learning, and um, the role of pharmacists is now have been pretty um, strengthened and shown to people uh, uh, regarding also vaccination and regarding information about medications and and everything. People. Um, like in my country knew our role better because pharmacists were normally like just drug dispensers, but now they trust them in about information regarding uh, medication. And uh, as I'm achieving also a diploma in infection, uh, infection prevention and control, infection control prevention, um, my eyes were open about basic hygiene standards that we also need people to be more aware of that if everyone followed and um, that would like differently impact how uh, we like people contract the disease and so on. Um, and my final lesson is that uh, uh, we like the learning uh, sea never is, is very, very big. It's like a, a huge ocean of, of um, information uh, we there is no end of the things that you can learn there's no end to the things that you have also to learn and to help your, your like people and patients and so on um, and yeah that's it for me thank you so thanks a lot Jilan uh, my takeaway message out of this talk is that we should first educate ourselves then educate our patients and be able to communicate and talk to them and mediate and explain to them that they need to do the vaccine or why they need to do the vaccine, why it's better for them and make sure that we um, decrease all those concerns that they have. Uh, now let's move over to our uh, next and final guest, Tanaka. Thank you so much um, for this uh, opportunity. But uh, my practice setup is a little bit different from um, the previous speakers. I am a public health pharmacist, um, a district pharmacist, meaning um, I run a district hospital. I'm in charge of a district hospital. 
but I'm also in charge of uh, 39 clinics uh, that are also in the in the district. For so for us, um, because uh, also our setup in terms of dealing with infectious diseases is a little bit different from my previous speakers because. Uh, as you can recall, in Southern Africa is, and particularly Zimbabwe, is still ravaged by HIV and AIDS, uh, TB, and also and also malaria. So the HIV, TB, and malaria program has been uh, really affected by the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so for patients that really take their that that are on art, we had just introduced the use of uh, TOD, uh, that is dolit and dolitography based uh, regimens for the management of HIV. And so the patients used to come to the pharmacy to collect their medicines uh, uh, on a monthly basis. So now with the lockdowns and the, the distances between the hospital and, um, and um, some of our patients, it was really difficult for them now to commute and uh, come to the hospital for their monthly supplies. So for that, we actually had to change and uh, where possible give six months uh, supply of medicines for HIV positive uh, patients. Uh, another challenge that was there is, is on uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. So we had really limited resources in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, and so we had to send samples to our national laboratory and that could take days. Um, so like I said, um, we are also ravaged by malaria. So you find out that the some of the symptoms that, uh, that are COVID symptoms, they are also malaria symptoms. Uh, for instance, the, the hot body, the, the fevers and the legs, uh, the chills, they are also malaria, malaria symptoms. So for someone who would be admitted um, uh, on, on malaria basis and maybe find out at the end of the day that the patient was actually a, a COVID patient. And uh, that uh, maybe also fueled the, the spread of the, the COVID-19 uh, disease uh, in the district and also um, to, to healthcare workers because we also had quite a number of healthcare workers that were actually also affected uh, by the pandemic also getting sick. Um, and uh, there's also an issue on uh, commodities, um, the PPE, because from uh, looking at it from a public health perspective now, um, we uh, will be looking at the health of, of the general population of masses and uh, so we are trying to prevent the, the COVID from spreading, but it would start with the availability of PPE for the various clinics that I do uh, run in the district. And we had a, I had a great challenge uh, in finding the correct uh, quantities of PPE given the numbers of patients that we are uh, trickling in, and uh, also the number of hospital admissions that we being uh, were rising um, due to COVID. So maybe as, as, as a stopgap measure, we, we had to uh, undergo some IPC trainings, uh, go to various uh, facilities in the district, train the, train the nurses there in primary healthcare workers there on, uh, on IPC and maybe on proper utilization of the PPE that is there. Um, uh, that then brings me to the vaccine uh, rollout. I think you can recall that Zimbabwe is uh, currently one of the best countries in terms of uh, the COVID-19 vaccination rollout plan. Uh, for, for the district, uh, really, we, we, we had to start with the sensitization program. Uh, people were a little bit skeptical. There was a high vaccine uh, hesitancy. And uh, for a pharmacist, um, you then become the point of reference. So everyone, we had questions about the vaccine. How does it work? Why, why, why are we using the Sinovac vaccine and not the Pfizer one? Or why are we using um, the Sinopharm vaccine and not necessarily the AstraZeneca that was being uh, used in South Africa, which is our neighboring country? So all those questions, people were asking, people were skeptical about uh, vaccinations. They were also skeptical about the, the, the time process or the time that uh, it took for us to, 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 to come up with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and uh, maybe basing on previous experiences of other vaccination programs. For Gokwe South District or for Zimbabwe, uh, immunization is not new. Um, people get vaccinated, they get the BCG vaccine, um, children are vaccinated uh, against measles, and I think uh, this week we'll be vaccinating against uh, typhoid. Um, 
Uh, so it's not it's not something that is new in terms of vaccination. But for the COVID nineteen vaccine, there was a lot of hesitance uh, because of uh, maybe the misinformation on 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 social media and other media platforms. So we had to to start with uh, debunking those things, uh, coming up with the truth uh, about the vaccine. Then we had to roll out the the, the vaccine program to the di district and the various uh, various clinics. Um, I think earlier on I've mentioned something on the HIV, TB, and malaria program. Uh, maybe with particular interest to the to the um, to the HIV program and how maybe we 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 ended up increasing the amount of stock for for patients that were were on HIV medicines. I think I'm also going to to mention something about um, strengthening the, the 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 IPC framework in in, in our in our in our context so as the vaccine was uh, rolled out we then have to had to uh, carry out a very rigorous pharmacovigilance uh, program because uh, as you know if, if a molecule is new then we might not have uh, enough information on uh, how the population in, in in our district are going to react to it so we we actually had uh, trainings on uh, adverse effects following following in, in immunization where we, we primarily focused on the unreported uh, adverse effects and scaled up reporting uh, for, for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, it was a huge challenge uh, for, for us, uh, primarily because the, the primary healthcare workers themselves, they were not interested in taking the vaccine and they were also not interested in, um, in, in, getting, in, in doing the adverse effects uh, reporting. Uh, because they were fearing for their lives. Remember, I mentioned that um, before that we did not we didn't have enough uh, PPE, so it was also a health hazard, or a risk to them, uh, for them to continue operating under under those under those circumstances. So I'm also part of the um, of the district interministerial task force that was um, that came into existence after in. Um, and order by his excellency. So the, the, the district task force is, uh, has got various departments uh, that also are also in the, in the, uh, in the districts uh, that are non-medical. Um, so including the roads, the transport ministry, uh, the education ministry, um, the local governance ministry. So we, we came, uh, they came together as a task force and uh, we were, working towards building um, emergency centers or, or COVID-19 isolation centers in the, um, in the district. And for that, the greatest challenge that we had there was an issue uh, on, 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 on funding and resources. Although we managed to uh, change uh, or change some of the wards that were already in existence at the local hospital into a COVID-19 uh, isolation ward, um, we, we still had that challenge in cascading it to other lower levels and other facilities in the, in the district. The interministerial task force is also the police in it and the, the national army. So those were assisting us with um, the lockdowns and maybe enforcement of the, the lockdowns. And uh, in Zimbabwe, there is now a law on wearing of uh, public wearing of masks it's, it's uh, if you are found not wearing a mask, in, in, in you, you you can get charged for that. Um, so th those are some of the experiences that I had to go through uh, as a district pharmacist. And maybe the greatest lesson that I can leave and say is, um, with COVID nineteen, uh, it was a new thing, and it really needed collaboration. I think uh, that uh, interdepartmental collaboration is still. Uh, essential uh, for pharmacists. Pharmacists need to know how to work with doctors, how to work with nurses, how to work with uh, other non-medical uh, professions, uh, ministers, politicians, etc. That can become in instrumental um, in, in 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 emergency responses and in um, in in handling um, public health emergencies. I'm also doing currently still doing my masters in public health. And um, this uh, pandemic uh, gave me a new perspective on how um, pharmaceutical responses can be essential 
in, in management of for outbreaks and also how to utilize epidemiological um, data in, in terms of planning and in terms of uh, management because we would notice that certain areas in the district were more hit than others and so in terms of allocation of resources we also had to uh, do it equitably and uh, make sure that the access uh, is there for, for each and every person uh, in, in those various areas. Uh, thank you so much for your time again. Uh, thank you. So thanks a lot, Anako. We really appreciate all your work. And as you said, through collaboration, either with other pharmacists or doctors or patients or all other non-medical uh, occupation, we, we would be able to excel through this uh, situation. Uh, now I would like to pass on to uh, yeah. my co-moderator, Naoko. Do you, Naoko, do you want to share any final words? Thank you, uh, Dimitrios, and, and thank you very much for the, all the panel members. That um, it was great an experience sharing to the, um, the all the audience to the different settings and the, and the different experience from the different levels of the student and the young pharmacist. I think it, the educators and all the sectors and the pharmacists. You know, we should learn from the the um, students and the young pharmacist what we can support and uh, how we can support and then what we can do for them to be um to to take them to be the best um the possible to be so uh, i think it, that is the great session that uh we learn from all of them so now questions and answer session that we have some time for so if you can put your questions in the question and answer box, so then we can pick up some question. So I have one question from Yogesh. Thank you very much for your question. So the, um, the question is, now I am also a pharmacist. So you to make probably how to make people come during the vaccination because people in India um, are afraid to take vaccine. So I think if any of the panel members you know, who have any um, experiences in, of this situation, trying to to you know, make the people calm during the vaccination, but also if there's any, any challenges you know, or any solutions you, know, you found, if that is, um, that would be great to share. Um, I think I can share something on that. That would be great, Tanaka. So if you can, yeah, great. Um, so I think uh, here looking at this, this is not an individual issue. It's uh, maybe an issue of public health concern. So you have to tailor your intervention, which is uh, you, you want people to acknowledge and accept vaccination. So maybe for, for, for that, you need to understand uh the the determinants the various determinants of health and why why are people in the first uh, place uh not getting vaccinated is it a cultural issue is it an information issue i'll share with you some of the experiences that we had here so the very first phase of the vaccine rollout we had about uh, 400,000 doses of uh, of the vaccine and uh, about, uh, let's just say 360 vaccines were at the hospital. And of the 360 available at the district hospital, less than 60 were uh, injected in the first week because no one was, was willing to, to get vaccinated, although the disease burden uh, was, was very high. So maybe I think in, in, in your approach, in, in tailoring your public health intervention, first of all, make sure people realize their susceptibility, how, how uh, that they are really at risk here. There's a threat of COVID-19. If they understand that, uh, that threat, then you can then tailor your, your, your message from, uh, from then to say, okay, if you don't get vaccinated, then probably this is what is going to happen to you. Yeah, I think you can uh, see 
how intense the situation is in the country. I think I've, I've seen something on India and in the Indian variant right now. I think you have really high disease burden right now. And I think for, for, for that, um, try to, to tailor messages uh, according to your various audiences in, in India and also try to identify why are people not vaccinated because for us really it was an issue of misinformation people were told that if you get vaccinated uh, you will die in the next six months or in the next two years you will develop very severe adverse effects and so what simply what we simply did is what healthcare workers got vaccinated first and when people saw that ah these people they got vaccinated but they're still alive they then came uh, to 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 get the dose, um, the other doses now, and the vaccination program is actually a success. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tanaka. Um, so I think it, that would be great. You know, the information shared and then the how to tackle already. I think that is in the great. Um, information to be shared. I think it, that we can move on to the next question as well. So this comes in from um, final year pharmacy student Laiva Wasim um, from Pakistan. So uh, she, he just is just about to step in the working field. Yes, congratulations. I would like to ask uh, the peers and how they built with the counseling the people if they're asking about why they are being vaccinated with particular type of vaccine. Is there any panel members who had the experience with such question and how did you uh, how you dealt with that? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So I think I'll say something and uh, I think Chantal has, has something to say. Yes. But um, so for us in Zimbabwe, we're using the Sinovac, uh, the, the one that is made in China, simply because our infrastructure there in terms of storage, um, the vaccine requires two to eight degrees Celsius in terms of uh, cold storage. Yet the Pfizer one uh, required um, uh, storage facilities that are way, way to the minors in terms of uh, degrees Celsius. So it means if we had to get the Pfizer vaccine, we then had to do a whole system overhaul, starting with um, the national uh, storage uh, facilities. And that was going to be a huge cost on the system. And so it was easier to utilize the cold storage that was already there, the two to eight degrees uh, that was already there for other vaccines that uh, the immunization program has already been uh, utilizing. So there was really no need for us to either look for the uh, Moderna or the, or the Pfizer vaccine because of the infrastructure limitations there. Then secondly, um, I think people will then raise questions on, so you simply got the vaccine because it's the one that suited you. How about the efficacy there? Um, and um, how about the, um, because the Pfizer vaccine has got the highest efficacy, if it was a mesh, an issue of preventing COVID-19, wouldn't you tailor your systems um, to get the best uh, in terms of efficacy? Um, so those questions will then come up and maybe somehow we address them. We simply explained on the cost of the system and then we also explained the um, to them that uh, even the current one that we're using, the efficacy was way above the 80s. And uh, and for us, it's not only an issue of, of cost, but also an issue of efficacy. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you, Tanaka. Shanto, I think you, so you have things to say, yeah. Yeah, I think that in the Netherlands, we had almost all the vaccines available. Also, you know, they were faced uh, with, I think we started with the Pfizer vaccine, then the AstraZeneca vaccine um, uh, got available, the Moderna also. And we had a lot of questions about the AstraZeneca vaccine because, uh, well, there was some risk involved uh, with blood clots. And um, prior to the, uh, the point where the vaccine was not given to patients uh, under 60, uh, we had a lot of questions of, um, uh, what the risk was of having those blood clots and if patients would have to get the vaccine or not. And I think that was really a matter of, um, you know, one negative news item can do so much damage to a vaccine uh, strategy and helping those patients and explain the numbers and explain that 
yes, maybe one in million uh, people that got the AstraZeneca vaccine will um, um, get a blood clot. It's not, you know, you can also prevent maybe 60 COVID deaths. And if you place that in perspective and really talk about the, the numbers, then uh, I think you're able to, to ensure that everything, uh, that everyone feels safe enough to get the vaccine. And um, well, you know, the media is, is a great tool to inform the, pa the patients, but also a very powerful tool when it comes to negative news. And I think that we as healthcare providers are very important to, um, to keep uh, displaying the facts and not only the, the, the sad stories about you know, the one in million that died of a blood clot, which is still very, you know, unfortunate. But if we look at the big picture, it's still uh, great that we have the vaccines, also the AstraZeneca, which is unfortunately still not available for patients under 60 in the Netherlands. So um, that was what I would like to share with you. Great. Thank you, Chantel. I think it is very important you know, from both of the, you know, the youth, Chantel and Tanaka mentioned that I think how we interpret the data correctly and how to communicate in the late term to the uh, patients in the public. I think we are the, you know, um, intermediator in how to deal with the, the such complicated science and information to be easy to understand in the public. I think that is a great example. So I think I'd like to go to the next question as well. I think it, um, Dylan already Dylan already answered in one question, but probably I'd like to ask these the same to Shanta and Tanaka as well because I think it, that is such a good question you know, for us in, in edu uh, as educators. So do you think you were well prepared in public health interventions you know, or emergency? And also, what would you, what would have made you more prepared for your new or evolving role during the health pandemic? Thank you, Daria, for the question. Would you land? Oh, Chantal, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I'm still reading the question. I um, let's see. So that so is. The yeah, that is a question. So do you think you were well prepared in public health interventions or emergencies? And also what would have made you more prepared for your new or evolving role during the health pandemic? Well, I don't think I was prepared enough. I don't think that anyone was prepared enough to participate in this pandemic. I think that it was kind of a automatic pilot that we were in that we were just you know doing what we were thought and um improvising mostly um so i don't i don't think that i was prepared but i i'm also not sure if i was that i could have been prepared enough i mean you can read about stuff and you can um educate yourself about how to um, um how to work in crisis but I'm not sure. Maybe if there was a, a book that, you know, said how I was supposed to be as a healthcare professional in a book and I've I've read it prior to the, the crisis, it would have made me a better healthcare professional. But I think that, you know, when you choose this profession that inside of you, there's um, something that also already wants to help people and do the best for people. And having that uh, trait makes you enough prepared to be in a crisis like this. So just, you know, having a, a big heart to all the patients out in the world. That is very much core of our pharmacy profession, I think. Thank you, Chantal. Um, so I think it, it's almost in our time to conclude that session. Thank you so much for the question, which we weren't able to um, answer, but um, hopefully we can answer in some way uh, through the Facebook you know, or also the Twitter account you know, from the section as well. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, now all the panelists and the co-moderator to be uh, on the stage. And we would like to say thank you to all the audience and also thank you to the, the panelists and the co-moderator uh, for the webinar. And thank you for the FIP to support in this webinar as well. 
So the recording of this episode will be made available on the FIP website. And please give us your feedback to the webinars at FIP.org email address. So we may continue improving our digital event offerings as well. And thank you very much and good day to you all.